Hi there, Booktube. It's Roz. It's the beginning of April, so it's time to look back, look back at my March and the, my you know, delights, discoveries, any disappointments, and to ask you about yours. I finished 11 books in March. Um, I'd say there were kind of two themes to my March reading. One was new novels, you know, fiction that's been published in 2023. And I read five of those, which is probably a higher than usual proportion. And yeah, got a few things to talk about from that. The other thing is that March is the month of multiple readathons that I kind of am attracted to. And I think I took part in four, March of the Mammoths, the Irish Readathon, Jewathon, um, Her Storyathon, plus a fifth, which is actually for April. I kind of got ahead of myself by um, reading a book for Trans Girl April as well. So, but my top bookish delight of the month was not a book that I read. It was a bookish event because on the 30th of March, it was UK Publication Day for um, for this book, The Secrets of Hartwood Hall um, by Katie, our Katie of Books and Things. And I was so delighted to be um, able to go to her book launch to support her and, you know, honoured too. Um, and picked up, well, I'd already pre-ordered a copy of the book, but I picked up a, a second copy um, that she signed for Tilly because um, Tilly couldn't be there. And I'm already 100 pages in and really enjoying it. In fact, I would almost rather be reading it now than making this video. <laughs> um, but the other lovely thing about the book launch was that there was a bunch of other UK booktubers there. And, you know, it really just confirmed for me something that, you know, I already feel in my heart, which is that, you know, bookish people and booktubers in particular are just really nice people. And yeah. We had a bit of a giggle and that was nice. So if one thing that Booktube has done for me is, um, say, connecting me with, with more lovely bookish people, another thing it's done is slightly change the way I read. Let me explain. Pre-Booktube, I was someone who would pick up a book, read it cover to cover, not necessarily all in one go, but, you know, over a couple of days or, or a week or whatever, and then put that one down uh, when I finished it and then on to the next book. And, you know, uh, uh, serial monogamy, you might call it. And I would never have multiple books on the go at one time. But, of course, you get into booktube and you get involved in readathons and read-alongs and group reads and buddy reads, and you learn that you can have more than one book on the go and, and sort of spread things out over a longer period. And that's been a real um, a development, I suppose, for me, because if you do that cover to cover thing, there are certain types of books that are quite off putting because they're, they're, they're too long and they don't really sort of lend themselves to that uh, approach. You know, like this is a classic example, um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So, you know, I'm now reading this at the rate of one tale a month. Um, of the Canterbury Tales and as a buddy read with the gorgeous and wonderful two title Trek, you know, and I, I would never have, I couldn't possibly have just, you know, ploughed through this without chopping and changing and having a bit of variety in between. And so my March of the Mammoth's Choice um, is a book that I've been putting off for years because certainly in the edition I've got, it's 1,100 pages. It's The Count of Monte Cristo and by Alexandra Dumas. And I mean, maybe the other reason why I wasn't then ultimately pushed to, to read it regardless was because, you know, swashbuckling adventure tales with dungeons and disguises and counts and treasure and pirates, you know, they're not my immediate go-to type of novel. But so many people have told me that it's one of their, you know, absolute lifetime favourites that I did want to read it. And knowing, and March of the Mammoths was, you know, obviously the time to start it. And no, having learned through Booktube that it works for me to spread books out, I'm approaching The Count of Monte Cristo as if it were four books of, uh, four volumes, I suppose, of an acceptable length. And I'm reading those one at a time. So I read the first of those in March. And I can reassure all those people who've, told me how wonderful The Count of Monte Cristo is. I agree. It is wonderful. I'm loving it. It's such fun. Um, the first sort of chapter or so, I struggled a little to kind of 
get with it and then totally hooked so there we go while i'm talking about too tight a trek it's just i'm just gonna flag that um the sonitarium is open again too tight is back talking about shakespeare's sonnets and with verve and figure and glamour and sensitive analysis and erudition strongly recommend it and i'll leave a link below we as of this week we're up to 100 tramps on it 117 there'll be another tomorrow uh, or two and uh, i will get through all of shakespeare's sonnets another long slow read you see there we go anyway let's talk about things i actually finished this month instead and the book that i read for the irish readathon or first of two was um Joseph O'Connor's new kind of historical fiction thriller um, in my father's house and that came out oh in at the end of January and I was particularly tempted to read it because it's set in Rome and I was in Rome in February so you know there's all the fun of sort of thinking oh yes I know where they're talking about you know but the book is set in Rome in 1943 uh, it's so you know partway through the second world war at the point when um the the nazis occupied rome and took control and it's based on a true story of an irish priest who worked in the vatican who who became involved in um uh, escape lines you know for getting allied prisoners of war and jews i think out of Rome to safety and he he sort of led one cell in this system of sort of escape lines and um it's pacey it's exciting it's got larger than life characters but you know they're based on real people so that you know it, it that makes it um all the more enjoyable i suppose it uses journals and letters and diaries and things to tell the story interspersed between or to sort of at like the bulk of it is a sort of 48 hour blow by blow build up to a big dramatic event but the the other bits sort of come in and out and kind of allow O'Connor to sort of manipulate the level of tension I suppose I think if you were a purist thriller reader you might find it a little bit too much sort of literary thriller you know a little bit too much description a bit too discursive but for me it was spot on and I really enjoyed it just loads of fun yeah and quite um you know genuinely a bit scary and and, and at moments and you know you, you worried about the characters the my other Irish readathon choice was doing double duty as a her story a thon choice too. One of the things I read for her story a thon was Femina by um, Yanina Ramirez, which is um, history about women, you know, medieval women. But I finished that on the 1st of March. And so I talked about it in my February wrap up because I read a lot of it in February. But um, this one is Nothing Special by Nicole Flattery, Irish author, um, quite young. It's her debut novel. She's written short stories before. And it it counts for her story a thon in that it's about the the protagonist is a real um, is based on a real life character in the same way that you know my father's house was based on a real life character but then fictionalized. But this one was fun because this character is actually someone that we don't we know existed but we don't know their name. Again, let me explain. So. We're in New York. It's 1966. Um, we're kind of in the world of Andy Warhol and the, the, his studio, the factory, and all his like hangers on, and you know, and but um, Warhol at that point had this idea for um, writing a novel by recording conversations with his circle, with his hangers on of you know actors and models and all of that, and, and artists and then having a group i think four women perhaps who were all together who transcribed those those audio tapes and that became the novel and those women that typed it up actually brought a lot to the novel because they had to kind of hear and guess and listen and fill in the gaps and and find ways of recording the noises off and you know but they're not credited at all um, in, in the novel that was actually published in 1968. And, and 
two of them, we don't even know their names. And so Flattery kind of runs with that, riffs off it, and um, she makes these two the two characters, um, these two real women, into the main characters of her book. And one in particular is a really convincingly sort of sad, disillusioned, or, or I don't know, sort of disaffected teenager who's looking for um, an escape from her rather like miserable home and, and, and boring life and gets caught up in the the world of of Warhol and Warhol himself is never um never named uh in in the book but is this sort of charismatic and yet a central figure but the way Flattery writes it you you get the picture of this world that is kind of glamorous but also quite nasty or sordid even I think it's um a really effective novel and I'd um I hope that you know in a year's time, it's kind of coming up on sort of prize lists and whatever, because, yeah, I think it's a goodie. Really gripping. And and the narrator has quite a deadpan way of describing things. She, she, her, she, there's, it's her older self looking, looking back at her, you know, 17 year old self. Um, and that's quite unsettling and yeah, really works. For the Welsh readathon, I read an even more kind of intense and unsettling short novel. In fact, even shorter, almost a novella. It was Cove by Kynan Jones, and that came out in, I say, Nickel Flattery, brand new, you know, just published in March. Um, but Cove was is a book from 2016, so new but not brand new, kind of recent backlist, I suppose you'd call it. Wow, what a thrilling little book. It the the what it is is there's a there's a man he's in a kayak he's gone out to on his own to kayaking in 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 the sea um, to scatter his father's ashes and a storm suddenly blows up and he's hit by lightning and is unconscious and then you know comes round uh, partly partially paralysed as you are if you've been you know hit by lightning. And he's alone, he's adrift, he's, you know, there's just the sea and the sky and his thoughts and his his love for his wife and unborn child to try and draw him back to land. It, it's, yeah, I won't say any more, but it, it's almost like a prose poem and I, a, a very special little book, I thought. Um, it, there's an extraordinary tension in this sort of minute description of how he's trying to survive, I suppose. And then other times when he goes off on, yeah, I can hardly do it justice. I felt like I, by this point I was on a bit of a sort of tour of the Celtic fringe of the British Isles. So the poetry book I read this month was a Scottish one, but yeah, Scottish poet, um, M. Strang. Um, also from 2016, as it happens, it's called Bird Woman. I thought it was good. It's she really draws on her. She has a fascination with like nature and birds and horses and things that she really brings into the poems. But also her experience teaching creative writing in a prison. Um, yeah, I. It came to my attention because she she's got a, no, a novel newly out, which is called what Quinn that was again just published this month. I haven't got hold of that yet, but I might, having really enjoyed the poetry. We'll see. Two of my March reads, I've done individual videos about them, you know, like single book reviews. So I'll, I won't say much about those really, other than to um, sort of say what they are so you could go to the review if you're interested. So one was um, a novel from Namibia, which was The Purple Violet of a Shantou by uh, Nashani Andreas, um, which was published in 2001. It's a good novel and an excellent choice if you're kind of reading around the world in some way and you'd like to read something from Namibia because it's it's you know it's not a oh uh, well it's good enough you know it, it, it's it's well worth reading um and the um the other was new fiction again um cursed bread which say you know published this year but was on the um is on the women's prize for fiction long list um it's by sophie mackintosh it's been a divisive book you know some people love it some people hate it and so i, I loved it and i tried to make a video about why i loved it but why you might not you know so to help people decide 
would you want to read this one or not? Um, and, uh, you know, so although, uh, I, you know, sometimes you can recommend a book to anybody, whereas this is a book where I think you need to know what you're getting into and then you, you, you're more likely perhaps to enjoy it. The other women's prize um, long list read that I read was even better, I think, than Cursed Bread for me. And that was Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks. Um, another debut novel. Um, uh, and it came out, oh, really recently. But um, yeah, this month, this month, I think. And um, it's set in 1970s London. And and then it well London and then Bristol and then Jamaica, and it's I suppose it's kind of about being young and black in London in the nineteen seventies when racism was rife and particularly in the the Metropolitan Police, and about finding your release and your identity and your 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 fun like almost in a sort of an almost in the through a music scene through dub reggae and um you know that's where the main character sort of finds her her niche and her 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 joy but that that is a very male dominated world and um trying to bring into that is creates one set of issues and then she gets sucked into something that is, um, uh, well, experiences a tragedy and they get sucked into something that is very sort of quite scary and difficult. I won't say more because it would be spoilerish. But what I would say is, it's, is it, you know, I mean, debut novels always have the odd clunky bit. But, you know, it, it sh- I think Jacqueline Crooks has chosen to do something really kind of quite brave and bold and challenging and she pulls it off because she brings in um hints of sort of the world of um obia sort of uh, um, magic and ghosts but in a way that is not um doesn't take over the book you know it's quite sort of subtle and satisfying and also she she really draws on um a kind of a historical period and place in a you know such an effective way and the central character um Yame is a, a brilliantly satisfying character if you, you the simplistic description of this book would be to say it's like a coming of age story about you know a woman finding her identity and her strength through music and um connection with her roots but that is to wildly oversimplify the book. As it happens, Mark Nash has done a single book review of Fire Rush that I would really recommend. If you're at all intrigued by what I've just said, go and watch his video. Weirdly, Mark Nash also happens to have done um, a, a detailed sort of um, single book review of the other new novel, new, you know, recently published novel that I read this month, which is The New Life by Tom Crew. Now, that is historical fiction further back, you know, so not nineteen, not the 1960s or the 1970s. This one is um, 1890s and you know, Victorian London. And it's um, based on the lives of two men who set out to write a um, a book about a book to try and change attitudes to male homosexuality um, in Victorian times. and But it's a loose retelling. It's not, you know, it's not literally um, their story. It, it it's, you know, takes that as inspiration and then runs with it. So, um, you know, it really is uh, about what it meant to be a gay man in, in the 1890s in, in, in the UK. And, and, and um, it goes into class and and um uh, yeah ideas about sort of sexuality at the time it um and mark says more about that in his review than i will attempt to it I mean, what i suppose is interesting was that it was quite a progressive period in in some ways when when ideas were shifting and people were you know looking perhaps to to make changes in society or accept things that previously they hadn't but that and so there was a reason perhaps to hope that attitudes to sexuality and and you know homosexuality could change at that point 
but actually they couldn't and didn't. And the Oscar Wilde trial kind of is wrapped into the story in that respect. The minor characters are really good in this book, and I really like the attention Tom Crew, the author, gave to the women in the book, and particularly the main characters' wives. So um, definitely... Uh, it, again, this is a book that has been device, divisive and some people have said they thought it was dull. I absolutely didn't find it dull. I found like the pace really picked up in the second half, mind you. So, um, again, a, an enthusiastic recommendation for me for that one. Now, I'm going to skip swiftly over my real life book group's choice for this month because that was The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak, which came out in 2021. And, you know, it's been talked about so much on booktube and elsewhere you know over the last couple of years i think you know i can't believe that you won't have heard of it if it's a book that you might like to read and you've probably already read it i think how much you enjoy this book depends on how comfortable you are with a fig tree as a key narrator um a fig that's okay but a fig tree that kind of can understand people and animals and birds and insects and relay their sort of what they've told them I had a slight problem with that but I did really love its depiction of the 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 pain of of the division of of Cyprus so yeah and the aftermath of that the sort of knock-on effects the um I I wasn't disappointed by the island of missing trees because I I knew that it had that that fig tree component and I was sort of was 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 ready for that and so that was okay the book that was my disappointment this month was um a book by E.M. Forster I'm part of um gender librarians sort of group that are reading all of Forster's novels in chronological order over the course of 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 the year so one every other month and this month March's was The Longest Journey which was his second novel and it was published in 1907. And he describes it as the one that he was most glad to have written, you know, kind of like his favourite. It was not my favourite Forster novel. You know, it, uh, it wasn't as funny. You know, the first one that we read was sort of a bit, un, you know, first novelly and unformed, but was funny and clever and I enjoyed. And the other, some of the ones I've read that he wrote later, I've really loved. This was, I sort of found it a bit dull and, and sometimes a bit nasty, really. I don't know. It yeah. Skip over it. Skip. Stop talking about it, Rose. There's no point. There's no point. The very last thing that I read in March was a book for April. This one, and that's Felix Ever After by um Case and Calendar. It's the one of the two trans girl April group reads, and um because I've got people April happening in April, I thought I would read it at the very end of March, and I'm glad I did. It's um. It's YA. It's YA with a kind of like a romance sort of plot to an extent, um, which is absolutely not Ros's sort of thing. You know, it's not something I would normally read. But I wanted to read it because one of the things I I know about it is that it's one of the most banned and challenged books in the US public library and school library system and um it came out in 2020 and you know since then it's you know yeah it's been so many times sort of challenged and attempts to ban it um which is tragic because it is a, a lovely lovely book that is really important to to i think to be there for um trans and non-binary young people to be able to see themselves in a novel like this and it 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 has like authentically tiresome teenagers in it that just happen to be, you know, trans and gay and non-binary and, you know, are just anything and everything. But the main character is a sort of um, uh, 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 a trans young man who, well, sort of trans, but realising that he's potentially non-binary um, and it's great. And um, yeah, worth well worth reading if you're if you're up for reading YA, which I, I'm not always, but I'm glad I did. So 
that was my lovely March of reading. Did you have a good month? Did, have you read any of these? I was. I love it when people say, oh, I've read that and, you know, we can talk about it a bit or um, I've been meaning to read that or I haven't read that, but I've read something else by that. Or, you know, all of that I really enjoy. So roll on your comments and have a great April of reading too.